So if you ask me, I really wanted to be an engineer. And I was really keen on um, electronic engineering. But I was not uh, I was not planning to become an IT professional because IT was not very popular at the time. It was not known to us. But as a as a student um, in school, we uh, we loved electronics. I used to make these small radios, crystal radios, one transistor radio, and sometimes they don't they don't work properly. So what we used to do was, you know, you need to have very good antennas. So we have these cables uh, uh, that are used to tie coconut trees in our garden, right? And I use those as antennas and then obviously, you know, the radios work really well. Even the crystal radio used to work really well. So I was very keen on electronics and I used to make graphic equalizers. Um, you know, we, those days, dancers were discos. We used to make disco lights, right? So as a kid, I used to do all this. So I was very keen to um, uh, do electronics, but I knew that I had to really, really work hard to get into University of Moratua, and only 25 students were taken uh, at the time. I mean, I, and if that kind of competition is there, if I was asked to do again, it might not be possible, but I was fortunate enough to be selected to Moratua, and uh, I was uh, being able to do electronics engineering, and I think that changed my life. After I graduated, I joined the newly established computer science and engineering department as an instructor. So during the same time, I was also looking for uh, job opportunities because um, our seniors had joined this brand new IT company and we all wanted to join this IT company. That company, it was very difficult to join that company because it had many interviews, many tests, aptitude tests, battery tests, attitude tests. So I went for all these interviews and finally um, they asked me to come and I was offered the job. This is uh, at a time when um, the university uh, lecturers assistant lecturers were offered 1050 rupees and this job offered me 3500. I went and told my head of the department at the time, sir, I got the job. But then he asked me, Lalit, really, do you really want to leave University of Moratua? If you stay around, we can uh, make you permanent and also we can give you, uh, provide you with higher education opportunities. So what did I do? I decided to stay back and work for uh, the computer science and engineering department. In fact, I had the uh, privilege of teaching the first batch of computer science and engineering students of University of Moratua. So that is how I got into IT. And then um, I got a scholarship uh, from the British government uh, to do a master's uh, and I selected a master's degree program in information technology. So that is how I really uh, got into IT and then we came back, uh, this was during the height of problems, not many people were coming back to Sri Lanka at the time, but we came back and, uh, and, and particularly because there was a Japanese grant uh, was uh, given to University of Moratua to enhance the computer science and engineering faculty and uh, we were there to establish uh, the facilities with the Japanese. And then um, I got uh, an opportunity uh, to do my PhD at the University of British Columbia and then again it was in mechatronics engineering. Obviously mechatronics engineering combines a lot of fields, electronics, information technology, and also mechanical engineering. So that is how I really got into um, information technology. As promised after my PhD, I returned to Sri Lanka, I returned to University of Moratua, and um, I was a senior lecturer, um, and I was still um, very keen to promote the IT sector. And uh, fortunately for me, um, the university appointment appointed me as the director of computing uh, center and this gave me a lot of opportunities to work with uh, uh, both government agencies as well as uh, private companies. Uh, government agencies like Export Development Board, Board of Investment 
and the private sector IT uh, companies. The private, I realized that the private sector IT companies were struggling to find good quality professionals. At the time, we were not producing large number of IT professionals. I did a simple calculation and all universities, Morotua, Colombo, Kalaniya, Jayavardhanapura, computer science, as well as students who did computer science as a subject, um, would have been um, about 200. This number was far inadequate to support the IT, the IT industry, which was fast growing at the time. So I actually wrote a proposal uh, to start uh, an institute within the University of Moratua to churn out uh, IT, uh, IT professionals in large numbers. Although people kind of agreed to this proposal, but nobody funded this proposal. Um, so government actually thought that uh, it was going to incur a heavy um, burden on the consolidated fund because it was going to be a part of University of Moratua. So uh, that idea, idea was not very successful, but then we um, group group of uh, professionals got together uh, and decided to form Sri Lanka Institute of Information Technology. We uh, started um, our, uh, um, our institution at the BOC Merchant Tower on, on, on the 16th floor of BOC Merchant Tower and we decided to um, enroll students. In fact, we did not have any degree awarding status at the time. This was in 1999. Um, so we, ha we invited applications for the diploma program that was going to be conducted by SLIT. We received over 3,000 applications, right? And we thought that there is a huge demand. We rented an additional flow uh, because we knew that the funds were coming in, right? Because we, this was going to be a fee levying uh, institution. Uh, and we enrolled 400 students, in fact, 395 students, right? And then again, um, in the following year, it was so popular, we received over 6,300 applications. And again, we expanded our facilities at BOC Merchant Tower and enrolled uh, 600 students. So, so now we were producing, uh, uh, training large numbers of IT professionals. Then during this time, uh, Mahapala Trust Fund uh, agreed to provide funds and this land uh, to further develop SLIIT and we started establishing the Malabi campus. So this is a purpose-built campus. We did all the designs. And then in 2002, we completed the facilities here, the first buildings here. With that, we were able to enroll more than 1,000 uh, students. So for the last so many years, we've been graduating more than 1,000 graduates. And the IT industry has also grown very rapidly because of the availability of these professionals. As you know, it has become the fifth largest export earner for the country. And as an institution, we have provided uh, the largest number of graduates for this industry. And talking about IT industry also, uh, we also, we work very closely with the industry, right? And we want to develop the industry as well because industry was also, although it was developing, it was a very nascent kind of industry, right? So it needed a um, lot of boost. Um, HR was only one aspect. So we, um, uh, with the help of USAID under the cluster initiative, competitiveness initiative, um, we developed a strategy. So the strategy was very clear. The first, the, it was a three-phase strategy. The first phase was to depend, de depend on the factors. It, first part was factor-based. The factors were human resources, infrastructure, business environment, legal environment, marketing and branding, right? So we took uh, uh, the human resource development part. Then there were other people who were involved in developing infrastructure, getting telecommunication regularized, uh, so regulation of uh, telecommunication industry and providing enough bandwidth. So those days people, we were talking about not having enough bandwidth and so on. But today we don't talk about it, right? Because at the time it was 
availability, the competitiveness came from the availability of factors as well as the cost of factors. Now, for example, if you take the business environment, right, what kind of incentives can be given, right? Um, if you take the legal environment, um, you know, getting the Electronic Transactions Act, Intellectual Property uh, uh, Protection Act, right, and uh, Data Protection Act. All these acts were also, you know, developing those, the en right environment was part of this strategy. So having those factors and the cost of these factors made this industry competitive at the time. But we knew that that was a time-bound strategy, right? So others could catch up, right? And this, therefore, the second part. Second part was going to be an efficiency-based strategy, right? If we, uh, what kind of uh, efficiencies, what kind of pro, how, how can the processes be improved, what, how do we scale this up, right? So if you look at, the, in terms of the, the number of programs, initially from SLIT side, we only had information technology program. Because we worked so closely with the industry, we knew as the industry grew, we knew exactly the kind of programs they needed. So we also launched computer systems and networking degree program, information systems program, uh, cyber security program, now of course software engineering program as the industry grew because earlier we were doing small scale software development. They want to develop large scale software development, architecting solutions and so on. So they needed high caliber people. Then we also started master's degree programs, right? So together with the industry we also you know, uh, develop program, developed and deployed. So the advantage of an institute like ours is we can understand the industry requirements, develop a program together with the industry. If we don't have these skills within this country, we also have partnered with a lot of institutions, a lot of universities outside. We can bring their help, right, and develop programs and deploy programs. Now. Now, very recently we started, we know that artificial intelligence, machine learning is developing fast, right? So we launched a data science program, right? So this is how we developed the industry and the third, coming to the third part of this industry, we know that efficiencies, uh, niche areas are also not going to last long, right? The next part is, if you want to be competitive all the time, you have to do R&D you have to be innovative, right? So the, you, we work with the industry to carry out research, research in appropriate areas, right? So that the industry can benefit from our research and also we can develop new products and services. Those are the ones ultimately that, uh, the, uh, those are the ones that are going to give us the competitive advantage, right? So that's the uh, strategy, and right now we are kind of in the in the last phase of the uh, in a second uh, last part of the second phase. But we really need to go into the third phase aggressively if we want to take the IT industry to the next level. So business incubators, um, you know, continuous R and D, and also working with industry for research and development. So it's no point in doing standalone research unless industry is going to benefit from it. So that is why it is very important for us to work in, in doing research, we want to partner with the industry and carry out research. So um, while I was working as a director of computing services center at the University of Morotua, as I said, um, I had the opportunity to interact with uh, organizations like uh, Expo Development Board and Board of Investment, right? So particularly with Expo Development Board, um, we realized that, uh, you know, we were, uh, as an export promotion industry, uh, as an pro export promotion uh, agency, we were not really using technology to promote our products and services. So I looked at how we can use technology um, to improve the situation and decided to uh, establish what is known as TradeNet SL, right? So TradeNet SL particularly, um, you know, um, use technology to uh, profile products, uh, profile markets, profile uh, our um, 
local companies, particularly SMAs, right, and promoted them through the internet. And, uh, and also we allowed um, uh, this platform, uh, also we allowed uh, these uh, local companies to transact uh, through this platform. So we launched what is known as Cyber Trader, and that was the first uh, electronic uh, commerce platform of Sri Lanka. I mean, this was started by uh, you know just uh, me and my student, and we were given a very small room. At uh, and a lot of people did not believe us at the time. Uh, we were given a very small room to do this, and and not money. So we had to use an old server, right? And uh, and people were not willing to spend money on software. So we had to use Linux. And we had to download Linux on an, in a very, uh, um, using a very slow internet connection. And overnight, we down, used to download the operating system and the components that go with the operating system, and somehow made that, uh, you know, made that uh, platform. So we were very happy, and thousands of exporters have benefited from this. They have found markets that they couldn't even imagine before through this uh, um, uh, electronic commerce platform. So even today, uh, at the Export Development Board, this has become one of the largest uh, you know, divisions. And uh, I'm sure they are benefiting from uh, this, this platform that we developed. I talked to you about um, um, uh, the, uh, the ICT strategy that we developed uh, uh, with the help of uh, Competitiveness initiative under the competitive uh, competitiveness initiative supported by USAID at the time, and one, after the strategy was developed, I remember uh, the minister who was in charge, uh, Minister Melinda Morogoda, he asked me to come and um, hand over the uh, strategy. He said, I remember the words, I want to convert this to a bankable document so that we can get funds from the World Bank. So we gave the document. And he uh, uh, worked with World Bank, people like Dr. Nagihana, who used to work with us uh, in a, a lot, uh, burning midnight oil, basically, how to structure this um, uh, East Sri Lanka initiative. And uh, I'm very happy to say that that saw the birth of ICT Agency of Sri Lanka, which has done tremendous work to develop the um, industry. Uh, and also, we, uh, we also wanted to have an industry association um, coming, out of, uh, coming out as part of this strategy. We developed one uh, that was not very successful, but later, a couple of years later, we all got together uh, and developed um, SLASCOM. So the, the birthplace of SLASCOM, I, I should say, uh, was at uh, the ICT agency. As you know, ICT industry is uh, developing very fast as an industry, and ICT industry is omnipresent, right? ICT is required in anything that we do today. Whether you drive a car or whether you navigate yourself, do anything at home, everywhere you use ICT. So you need large numbers of ICT professionals to support these developments. Hmm? So as an industry, it is uh, it is developing very fast and it requires large numbers of professionals. Right? Uh, but if I were to advise um, any, any graduate, right? I think uh, whether it is ICT graduate or any graduate, um, you know, a lot of people come after um, A-levels. And um, this is what we find when we te try to teach students. They are used to a particular way of studying and their kind of goal is to pass exams whereas in a university that is not the thing in a university these uh, students are going to be transformed from school students or school kids to professionals professionals who are going to practice in industry in becoming a professional acquiring knowledge advancing knowledge is important but that is not the only thing, right? Especially if, when you are used to, um, you know, studying in school, 
teach the teachers, you learn, maybe you go to a tuition class and do some problems and that is good enough to pass exams. But here, that's not it. Passing exams is not enough because you need to be able to apply your knowledge and solve real world problems. And in solving real pro world problems, you need to understand, critically analyze what these problems are. And sometimes your knowledge may not be enough. If your knowledge is not enough, you need to do research. You need to see what others have done and develop a solution. And when you are develop a so developing a solution, sometimes it may not be just by, just by yourself. You need to work with others. You need, you need to have the ability to work with teams. Sometimes you need to be able to lead teams. So these are the other skills that one must acquire while going through a university course. And that will make, these attributes will make a good professional, whether you are an IT professional, engineer, business professional or whatever, right? Ultimately, what is needed from you is to have these sets of skills so that you can contribute towards society, right? So that's, that's whatever the field that you are in, you need to be able to solve problems, be innovative. Sometimes, um, you know, today's solutions may not be appropriate. You have to come up with innovative solutions, innovative products, and these will make advance our society so that it will become a happy place for all of us.